In the waters of baptism, Peter died with Christ. May he now come to share in the fullness of the resurrection. life, Peter cherished the gospel of Christ. May Christ now greet him with these words of eternal life. Come, blessed of my Father. In baptism, Peter received the sign of the cross. May he now share in Christ's victory over sin and death. In life, Peter served as a priest of the church. May he now share in the banquet of eternity. It's lovely to welcome you all to St. Barnabas Church this afternoon as we meet in silence to commend Peter's soul to God and to pray for those who love him. I'm Bishop Philip, the Bishop of Burnley, and with me is Father Michael, Father Michael Childs, who's the parish priest here. St. Barnabas. These are very strange times to have a few, of course, limited numbers, masked faces, social distancing. It's particularly good though that people can join us through the live stream, and if you're watching this on live stream, you're especially welcome, particularly one of Peter's sons, Christopher, unable to do that with us because he lives in the seas. The other thing we come to is sing, but that's not going to stop us having music, and we're going to enjoy a couple of Peter's favourite hymns. The first, For All the Saints, I'd like you to sit during this day to enjoy the words and the music and the stillness of this place.
we would have sung it better. Would you say In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, in the name of Jesus and of his church, we gather to pray for Peter, that God may bring him to everlasting peace and rest. We gather also to pray for those living through the pain and darkness of grief, especially for Carol, for Penelope and Christopher, Jonathan, David, and Andrew, Peter's grandchildren, and for the rest of the family, for those who served, he served as a priest, for his friends, and for all who mourn him. We share the pain of loss, but the promise of eternal life gives us hope. So let us comfort one another as we turn to God in prayer. Almighty God and Father, it is our certain faith that your Son, who died on the cross, was raised from the dead, the first fruit of all who have fallen asleep. Grant that through this mystery, your servant, John Peter, who has gone to his rest in Christ, may share in the joy of his resurrection. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Would you please be seated? We're going to listen now to Psalm 121, chosen not just because it's a beautiful and appropriate psalm, but also because Christopher, one of Peter's sons, used to sing it particularly well when he was a boy. Jeremy Larkin, um, and I'm here because uh, not only a friend of 
Peters, but I was captain of HMS Fearless during the Falklands campaign, which probably crowned the careers of, of many of us. And of all Peters' many ships and appointments, it was certainly his greatest challenge, as it was indeed for all of us. Uh, and I wear my medals today on behalf of HMS Fearless, the ship's company who I represent, and on behalf of Peter, who deserves them just as much as I do, as on behalf of the ship. Uh, 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 now, Fearless joined the Falklands campaign. She had a ship's company of 600, and 80 were Royal Marines. Uh, but throughout the Falklands campaign, we had on board every day no less than 1,400 people. Uh, and for occasions, uh, 1,700 just before the landing. And Peter and his colleagues from uh, other denominations did a wonderful job as not only, of course, being within the wardroom, which gave them, I suppose, a class status, but being trusted absolutely by everyone on board. And he and many, many depended on his counsel, his friendship, and his presence, and his care for everybody. And I guess I know, Phil, that they were enormously welcome. I'd like now to read from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part. We prophesy only in part. When the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put, a, put an end to childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now we know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Don't present him as a saint. Carol gave me that very clear instruction when I visited the family a week after Peter's death. It's wise advice because each one of us is a sinner in need of God's mercy and grace. But, stupidly, I pushed for evidence. Why wasn't he a saint? I asked. Oh, said the family almost in unison, he was opinionated, principled, determined, loyal. Honest, generous, wise, a listener. Now, what do we notice about those words, which I quote exactly as I heard them? Well, of course, they get more and more gentle as the list goes on. Carol is right, I'm sure. Peter was no saint, but saint or not, he was deeply, passionately, 
profoundly loved by those who are close to him. And so we we'll start, therefore, with the family. I first met Peter on a grim hospital ward, and he was pining for home. He wanted to be with Daisy, the dog. And even more, he wanted to be with Karen, the wife he married in 1971 and loved until the end. It was not uncharacteristic of Carol, I suspect, that she sprung Peter from hospital when the staff weren't looking, so he could die accompanied by his family and at home, and it would have been appalling for it to have been any other way. Peter and Carol brought into the world one of those legendary families of which Church of England clergymen seemed so uniquely capable, Penelope, Christopher, Jonathan, David and Andrew, I was told to use full Sunday names this afternoon, brought Peter the most immense pride. He was to them a wise counsellor where they could turn in times of need. He was for them an outrageous comedian whose Tom and Jerry inspired humour could light up a room with laughter. He was a friend who welcomed their friends into the family home so that the vicarage was a place of joy and mirth and parties. He was a fan who would go anywhere to listen to them sing or watch them play sport, or if necessary, take out an incompetent referee. But above all, he was a father, a father whose loyalty to his children was so deep that he happily gave up the job he loved in the Royal Navy so that their education and upbringing could be stable. And what he offered so generously and lavishly to his children, he then, by natural extension, offered equal to the nine grandchildren whom he so shamelessly adored. Saint or not, he was a husband, a father, a grandfather, so deeply loved that the pain of grief is deep and desolate. Don't deny that pain. Make time to grieve. Comfort each other in grief. Remember also that grief is the sign of love, for love is not love unless it suffers. After his family, the next thing in Peter's life was his ministry as a priest. Peter was a traditionist, a sound Anglo Catholic, a close friend to that legend of the Catholic movement, the late Father Bill Brandon. And sadly, though unsurprisingly, Peter became somewhat disillusioned with the Church of England in his later years. We've all been there, to be honest. Sadly, because he served the church so faithfully. After training at King's College London and following a curacy in South Shields and Durham Diocese, Peter became a chaplain to the Royal Navy, a ministry which we just heard first-hand witness, a ministry to which he was extremely well suited and which he loved with all his heart. The culmination of that period of his life was his involvement in the Falklands War. Listen to this, part of his own reflection on that experience, Peter's own words. Ascension Day, 20th of May, found us crossing the TEZ on the final leg of our journey in thick fog. It went through my mind at the time the clouds that had received the Lord were now providing us with the essential cover that we needed to reach our destination safely. As the day went by, the tension mounted as men prepared themselves and their equipment, going over the final details of their orders again and again. At 2100, I celebrated the Eucharist in Brigadier Thompson's cabin it being the only available space on board. People packed into this small area, everyone facing perhaps the most critical night of their lives. Those graphic words say for me everything about the sort of chaplain Peter was to those he served. His profound care and compassion for the sailors to whom he ministered his understanding of their feelings and fears, his ability to bring the life of Jesus into even the most frightening situations, 
and at his heart, the Eucharist, the gift of Jesus himself, celebrated in a crowded room for men anxious for the hope that only Jesus can give. Ministry for Peter in that time was incredibly vivid, indeed quite possibly traumatising, because he never really spoke about it. He had the responsibility of recovery and burying the Argentinian dead at Goose Green. He flew onto a ship to minister to its crew days before it was sunk by the Argentines. He was shown on television, taking the funerals of the war dead. He even wanted to give up his cabin to a prisoner of war, the defeated Argentinian General Menendez. But Peter delighted in naval chaplaincy. He loved the teaching. He loved the travel. He loved the friendship and the camaraderie. He loved the way he could relate on an equal footing to every rank and occupation. He was deeply appreciated and respected in his role as chaplain, remembered for years afterwards by many of those who served. But in chaplaincy, you're moved every two years, and it proved hard to reconcile these constant changes with family life, which is why the second part of Peter's ministry was much more stable, spent in the village of Mellor, just outside Blackburn. It sounds like Peter took very naturally to parish life, despite his long absence from it, and he developed a ministry that touched every aspect of the village. He had an especial affinity with the young, who was a much-loved character in the church school, demonstrating again his love of teaching. He also developed a full and colourful ministry in the village parlour. A notable aspect of his ministry was the number of adults who came to faith and were presented for confirmation. At least one of them recruited over a pint. He enjoyed the able lay leadership he found in there and made a number of close and rich friendships there. The whole family threw themselves into the life of the parish, singing in the choir, ringing the bells, breaking into the building site for the new vicarage, throwing green frisbees down the cavity walls, presumably there to this day. And Peter showed a real deep commitment to the parish the love of its people. Peter retired from Ella in 2007, and he and Carol moved to Lancaster, to the house near the university campus where various sons were then being educated. Over the years of retirement, he was able to commit more and more of his life to his family and to the growing number of grandchildren. However, his relationship to the church grew distant as it moved in directions he struggled to follow. But listen to some more of Peter's own words, again from his recollection from the Falklands conflict. No paper on the role of chaplains will be complete without a section on reconciliation, because as priests, this is what we are about, reconciling man to God, man to himself, and to his brother. And then a little later in that paragraph, there can be no finer vehicle for reconciliation than the Blessed Sacrament, which throughout had been our lifeline and was now a visible expression of a unity that transcended nationality and human faith. It was my privilege to attend to Peter in the last days of his life, and in that noisy, crowded, hot, horrible ward, to anoint him with oil and to feed him with the Blessed Sacrament so that he could be reconciled to the God he served so faithfully as one of his priests. It was one of the most powerful moments of my ministry as amidst all the cacophony and voices and nurses and loud TVs, a deep sense of calm descended upon him the mutual work of prayer. Don't present him as a saint. I know what Carol means, of course. He was a sinner, of course he was. Doubtless there were times when he got on your nerves, banged on about things, was cantankerous and difficult and argumentative. He was a close friend of Bone Brandy, so of course there were. But 
that he loved and he was loved. And he died reconciled to God. And maybe actually that's enough to be a saint. Maybe, Carol, I should present him as a saint. Not because of any personal virtue, but because of the grace of God at work in him. God who raises up these fragile, sinful, broken lives of ours and transforms them to the power of his love, to the glory of eternity. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love never fails. In the heat of Bacco and in the village park, amongst the dead of Goose Green and in the primary school hall, on the deck of a destroyer and at the family dining table, in the helicopter and in the choir, at the font and at the graveside, in life and on his deathbed, and at the altar, again and again at the altar, in the Blessed Sacrament, Peter showed us the way of love. And he showed us the way of love because he showed us the way of Christ. And that's enough. That's more than enough. For today, Christ claims Peter as his own, set free by the cross, safe for all eternity, amidst the company of the saints and in the glory of heaven. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen.
When Great Trees Fall by Maya Angelou. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. Lines hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber out the same. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly. Our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory, suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die, and our reality, bound to them, takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses, restored, never to be the same, whisper to us. They existed. They existed. We can be be and be better for their existence. First time I went into a pub as a curate, I was told to get out by the landlord and the clergyman should not drink. So I was delighted to share and to hear that beautiful memory. And as a priest myself, I don't think it's possible I may have met Peter, uh, but I don't think I did. But as Bishop Philip pointed out, we priests share um, in something special in our ministry to our people and to be given the opportunity to share in Peter's field today and to have it in our church. It's a great privilege, so Carol and family. Thank you. Let us pray. God of mercy and Lord of life, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. Today we give you thanks for Peter, for the grace and mercy he received from you, for all that was good in his life and for the memories that we treasure today. You promised eternal life to those who believe. Remember for good this, your servant Peter, as we also remember him. Bring him and all who rest in Christ into the fullness of your kingdom, where sins have been forgiven and death is no more. Your mighty power brings joy out of grief and life out of death. Look in mercy on all who mourn Peter's loss. Give them patient faith in times of darkness and strengthen them with the knowledge of your love. You are tender towards your children and your mercy is over all your works. Heal the memories of hurt and failure. Give us the wisdom and grace to use aright the time that is left to us here on earth, to turn to Christ and follow in his steps, in the way that leads to everlasting life. God of mercy, entrusting into your hands all that you have made, and rejoicing in our communion with all your faithful people, we make our prayers to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
O eternal Lord God, who alone spreadest out the heavens and rulest the raging of the sea, who hast compassed the waters with bounds until day and the night come to an end, be pleased to receive into thy almighty and most gracious protection the persons of us, thy servants, and the fleet in which we serve. Preserve us from the dangers of the sea and from the violence of the enemy, that we may be a safeguard unto our most gracious sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, and her dominions, and a security for such as pass on the seas upon their lawful occasions, that the inhabitants of our island may in peace and quietness serve the ark, and that we may return in safety to enjoy the blessings of the land, the fruits of our labors, and that with a thankful remembrance of thy mercies to praise and glorify thy holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now pray in confidence to the Father, in the words our Saviour gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In a few moments, we will sprinkle uh, Peter's coffin with water, a reminder of baptism, and we'll sense it with incense, a reminder of the heavenly life, she is called to be faithful in Jesus Christ. And then we'll say our final prayers of farewell and condemnation. Before that, though, we'll uh, listen to our next hymn, a hymn which has particular associations with uh, Blackburn Diocese. It's written by a priest who Peter Balfour sort of known. We have a gospel to proclaim.
Would you like to stand? Trusting in God, we have prayed together for Peter, and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Peter again and enjoy his friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another Jesus Christ. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother, John Peter, in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed on Peter in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us to remain, to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In peace, let us take Peter to his place of rest. Paradise. Where the 
Lord has come to welcome and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem.
Thank <laughs> you. 